All right. Um, thanks, Jamie. I want to add one more thing. We are now teaching Stop the Bleed at the Daybreak location. So we teach once a month at uh, downtown at 525 building, and then we teach out in uh, Daybreak second Wednesday of each month. Um, so if you want to join us for that, you can find us on Eventbrite. All right, let's get going. Um, I'm really excited to introduce my uh, presenters today. One of them I have been with quite closely for almost 30 years. Um, I actually met him in a restaurant. So for the last 30 years, he's made fun of how I cut things. And um, we've had many injuries in our household, which from looking at national statistics, a lot of people have. Uh, but due to knife injuries, one instance where I took my daughter in and she actually did not need stitches, which is why I have invited my second guest today, Dr. Jeremy Baird. Um, he was the one, he's an emergency medicine doctor at the South Jordan location. And he stitched up my son, um, probably what, three, four weeks ago now after he caught his hand on a face, uh, a football helmet during a football game. And I thought of getting him on here because he just was sitting there talking to me about why he was doing the stitches and what kind he was using. And so I thought he is perfect for this. So I'm gonna turn the time over to Mike to start us with knife safety, especially as we go into the holidays. Um, and then we will switch over to Dr. Baird to talk about when things don't go so well for you. Hey. Okay. Hello, my name is Mike Braga. And as Ruth did not mention, Ruth and I are married going on 30 years now. My lovely wife, and she convinced me to speak today. So my pleasure to be here. I'm a little bit of my background, as Ruth mentioned, I was a sous chef for years, uh, and I was at the Joseph Smith Memorial Building when we met 30 <clears throat> years ago. Um, so I just want to go over some basics on knife safety, um, because like many people, I have spent a Thanksgiving in the emergency room with someone who was cut. Not me, but my brother. Um, so we're going to go for basic knife handling, safety, sharpening, things like that. So to start off with, many people have these knife sets at home, and a lot of people don't like to use them. They get in the way, they slide to the countertop, what have you. But what I've noticed is that many knife injuries that I've seen happen from people reaching into the, the uh, drawer, blindly to grab a knife and cutting themselves. That's why these are great, help cut down on one of the bigger risks that you have. Um, some of my knives I keep in an old school, um, knife toolbox, and most knives nowadays will come with these sleeves. Again, chefs in kitchens hated working with these, but they work, they help prevent cuts. So if you have these, don't be afraid to use them um, to keep your knives. A, it helps to prevent you getting dings and divots in your knives, and then B, it helps to prevent cutting. Uh, I wanted to go over real quick, different types of knives because we all get these fancy sets and not everyone knows what they're for. So let's go over these real quick. Long serrated knives like this, generally a bread knife. You're gonna use cutting loaves of bread, bagels, things like that, okay? Um, small knife like this is known as a paring knife. This one is used for cutting things like small produce, strawberries, things like that, where you're gonna be doing precision cutting, okay? A longer blade that is thin, like this, this is a boning knife. We'll use this for cutting fish, seafood, um, deboning, cutting the skin off seafood, things like this. A lot of chefs are anti-serrated knives because old school, we like to have our long, fancy, sharp knives. But for people who don't have a lot of experience, a serrated blade really is helpful. You don't need to sharpen them as much. And they can be pretty sharp and precision when it comes to cutting. So don't shy away from a good serrated knife. Of course, we have 
what my the chef who trained me called uh, June June cleaver. Um, this is used for larger items, cutting ribs off of bones, uh, cutting larger produce like squash, pumpkins, things like that. And then, of course, your everyday utility chef's knife. Um, and this one really just comes down to preference. These have become very popular lately, but they're both great knives to use. Um, so when we have the knives, what is more dangerous, a very sharp knife or a very dull knife? The answer to that, of course, is a dull knife. You don't have as much control with a dull knife. So there's some great services out there to get your knives sharpened. Online services, you can order a place you can have them done. If not, here's a few quick ways to sharpen your knife. You can get these little knife sharpeners anywhere online. This is like $10. Um, Ruth is going to hate this because of the noise that it makes. But if you look in this, it goes different levels. So this will get a really jagged edge and then finer and finer, okay? So just put it down, take the knife, um, heel to toe, heel to toe, there you go. And then it's gonna go to the finer one, to the finer one. Now what this will do is kind of make a jagged edge in the knife and make it for all intents, intensive purposes sharper. Everyone knows the steel. We've all seen chefs doing this, walking around doing this. What is it for? What this does is it takes those little um, divots you put in the knife using the sharpening and it also takes the slivers off of the knife. So you just want to do a couple of those. Again, you take the heel down to the toe, nice um, steady strokes. Okay. Another thing that a lot of chefs do not like to do is safety gloves because they think these are for amateurs. These are also for people who don't want to spend the day in the ER. If you've got a little nick, this prevents. Now you can still slice your finger pretty good if you're doing it totally wrong, but these do help. So if you're new with knives, this came free with um, this knife, but you can also get these online three to $5. Basic investment, they do a lot of good if you think you're going to be doing a lot of cutting. The next thing that I want to talk about with knives is how to hold a knife. Because I see all kinds, I see this, Thing where they do this. I see them holding it all the way back like this. To me, none of these are natural. And you're going to get your hand tired faster because how many of us walk around like this all day? It's awkward. I, I'm not sure why people do it. If they're like, oh, I can get better precision. You really can't. The way it was shown to me is it's like you're going to shake someone's hand. Hand like that. Put the knife here, thumb around it, there you go. Okay, grip with the back. This is nice and natural. You can hold on to it. You're not gonna go side to side. And that's where I see the injuries happen is when people get tired and their knife slips this way, slips that way. So, hand open, grip, thumb against it, nice and natural, okay? That is called the handshake technique when it comes to the knife. The opposite hand, equally as important. So what you will see with the opposite hand is a claw, okay? And this is, it is called that because you know, do your hands over like that, like a claw. Some people put one lead finger forward, but what you wanna do is wrap those fingernails under so you don't cut them. And then the knife is going to slide up and down your lead finger. And when you're cutting something, you'll start to push it with your thumb as you're cutting, okay? So let's back step a second here. Sorry, I jumped. Um, when you're cutting, we've got them all set up, right? We've got a sharp knife. We've got the produce that we want to cut. We have two cutting boards set out. In your home, you wanna have at least two cutting boards, one for produce, one for protein, because cross-contamination is gross, but that's a different class. So I'll just say real quick, get two cutting boards. Okay, your basic plastic cutting board that a lot of us have. What's the problem with this one? It's gonna slide all over the place. When you're cutting, you don't want it sliding. That's how injuries happen. So we have two solutions for that. They make these little rubber grippers. Again, you can get these online. 
put that underneath there, down, and there we go. All right? You don't have a rubber grip right home. It's Thanksgiving. There's no time to get it online. Another easy solution. Paper towel. Get the paper towel damp. Spread it out. And again, it's gripping. So it's not going to slide. Other cutting boards that they make like this one have rubber grippers on it. These are great. Really safe to use, really nice. I love this one because it's got the divot in there. So if you're cutting protein that's got juices coming out, this is going to be a little safer. As you can see, the divot in here as well. But again, nice and simple. Wet paper towel, you're good. Okay. So let's say we're going to cut a tomato. Okay. Honestly, the less ripe a tomato, the easier it is to cut. Because once they're really ripe, juices go everywhere, right? So all that we're going to do, let's say we want to slice it, okay? Grip, like we talked about. Hand in there, and we're just going to go in there, heel the toe, slice down, okay? Real easy, cap dip, slice down. And that's really it. Now you're going to see some people that are tempted to hold both sides and cut. We call them future ER visits. You really don't want to do that. You want to hold here and just, there you go, nice and simple. Now you're saying, well, your sharp was pretty, your knife is pretty sharp. You just sharpened it. Okay, this serrated one we talked about. And you can get those really paper thin if you're doing it right. If you want to get bigger chunks, again, just grip them, heel to toe, nice and even all the way through. We're using the thumb to push it forward, okay? When you're cutting something, you really want to find the flat surface to it. So let's say you're dicing up 20 mushrooms. There's absolutely nothing wrong with cutting a little tip off the end of the mushroom so it'll lay flat and then cutting it. I know we all like the pretty circular cuts, but if you're doing a lot of them, no one's really going to notice. So cut the little tip off the bottom so it's flat and go from there, okay? With a carrot, you know, it's one that rolls a lot. So try to find, there we go, flat spot to it, claw, and there we go. Easy, big chunks. Again, always hold the proper technique with the claw so you don't hurt yourself. We all get in that situation where we want to cut it lengthwise, right? When you do that, tap it on both sides. And again, try to find a good place. Thumb down, heel, and there you go. Again, don't be tempted to go on both sides of it because that's, I cut myself once. Going like that, the knife slips right into you. So out to the side, and there we go. Nice and even, okay? With meat, if you're cutting meat and produce, you just wanna make sure that it is clean because chicken especially and beef can be a little juicy, slimy, if you will. Those make it a little more difficult to cut. So just make sure you have that. And then onions, everybody's favorite friend, same thing that we've been doing. And if you notice with the onion, we've got the two tips. If you leave the tip where the stem was on there, it'll hold in those that acid. So if you come in and you cut it with the stem still on there, it's not gonna make your eyes water as much. So we cut it off. I'm just gonna peel back one layer so I can get to it. And a lot of times it is that preparation of how are you going to cut it instead of just finally going out there. This when you see the lines in it already. So we're just going to follow those. And then it looks the little fancy ones like you see on TV. But 
It is just a matter of preparing for it before having the proper technique as I dropped some onions on the floor, you didn't see that. Um, but grip it correctly, make sure you sharpened it beforehand, nice clean surface that you know will not move. And that is how you're going to prevent yourself from cutting while you're working. Do we have any other? We shift my notes, see if I can do something. I'm gonna say doing into small cubes. Into small cubes, okay? So we've cut it. We're going to take both ends off. This will make the uh, eyes water a little bit. But since we cut one end off of it so it's flat, now what are we looking for? One inch cubes? Follow through all the way. And now the claw that we're using, pinky thumb on either side of it. And there we go, there's about one inch. These were really good in stews, curry, things like that. So there we go. And then we'll do the same with carrots, cut them that way. Um, when you're cutting bread, bagels, things like that, you'll want to set it down and go this way. We don't want to hold a roll or a bagel and do this. Because again, that's a future ER visit. So when you set them down, use your hand to know about how far you're going to go, an inch up, inch and a half up, and just straight across. Not that at all. Um, and you'll do the same when you're cutting meats. Sorry, I didn't have extra steaks to bring today. Um, but wash them off first. And then it's going to be, again, always, you'll want to work on that to grip and heel down. All the way through. Okay. Can you explain how to do it? Because one of the things that's blown my mind is the watermelon. So when you're talking about cutting fruit. Mm -hmm. So one thing that I see a lot of is when someone is peeling a watermelon, is let's say this is a watermelon. They will take the watermelon, they will cut it, and then they'll cut a slice off. So that they have a round of watermelon, and then they'll take another knife and go around like this to peel the watermelon, and then basically cut out the meat of the watermelon and throw the the peel away. Makes no sense to me. So take a watermelon. We're going to let's say cut it in half. Okay. So say this is a watermelon. You would cut across the top. Removing this top and then down the sides all the way around. And then you might need to go and revisit it to get all the white off, but basically there's no peel on there now. You do the same thing with the watermelon. Once you've done it like that, then you can lay it down and just cut big slabs of watermelon and then cube them. You can do that watermelon, cantaloupe, every kind of melon. Yeah, so we brought up the example of spaghetti squash too. So, yeah. yeah. So with spaghetti squash, what you're going to do? What I do is I will take my cleaver, hold on to the cleaver nice and tight. I will put the cleaver into the squash, and then freehand tap it until it really gets into there. So you might need to kind of hit it once it's broken into the squash. Then you can start to go at it. But get that initial part in there. You're gonna to have to hit it a little bit. Make sure your knife is nice. Your knife is nice and sharp, and that's how you'll then be able to half the spaghetti squash. But those can be tricky because they roll a little bit. Okay, hey, let's. Um, I'm just trying to get over to Dr. Baird here to make him a co-host. Do you have it? Do you want to share your screen at all, Dr. Baird? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I have some images I'd like to show. You are a co-host, so you should be able to share. It looks like I can. Yep. Okay. Are you ready? Are you ready to go? Okay. 
All right, let's see if I can. Let's see if I can do this. <laughs> uh, here we go. All right, so first, I love what Mike explained because uh, every time I show up somewhere, people go, can everybody hear me okay and stuff? Two thumbs up, are we okay? Um, every, everywhere I go, people go like, oh, you're here. So now, uh, thank goodness an ER doctor is here. And I say, I always say, I can make the best out of a bad situation, but I'd rather avoid the bad situation altogether. So it's uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of nice safety and everything. I think I'm showing this layers of the skin here because the question is, is like, when do you need sutures? And uh, first thing, I'm going to talk about the hands a little bit because we're just looking at cutting. And first of all, the avocado industry has kept us in business because especially when avocados became more popular, uh, we started seeing tons of different wounds on the hands because they're just kind of awkward and getting the pit out and everything. But the one interesting thing about the hand is, is that um, there's been numerous like articles and studies and stuff that show that if the the wound is less than two centimeters, so about that big, you actually don't need sutures. Even it, but now that's you got to clarify that a little bit because if there are deep structures involved and those kinds of things, a different story. But um, uh, the caveat to that is, you uh, if it's over like a joint or something of that nature, then it gets challenging for healing. So I just want to tell you one time, I cut my finger right over a joint right here, and I'm like, okay, that's like a centimeter long. I was cutting uh, stems off of roses and clearly not using uh, safe knife techniques, evidently. Anyways, I got a cut and I'm like, okay, I'm going to put this to the test. I'm going to test this out. It's a centimeter. It does. Every, when I bend it, it does gape. So what I did was I got it approximated and then um, put some ointment on it, washed it out really well. I'll talk about those steps in a minute. And then I just had to keep it immobilized. And But I had to keep it immobilized for like seven to 10 days because every time I'd bend it, it would crack again. So anyway, like I say, the caveat to the two centimeter rule is that if it's going to keep on opening up, then it's probably better to just get sutures. So let's look at this picture really quick. This, um, this epidermis and the dermis and the subcutaneous tissues, this, this outer layer here is like what we call the epithelium. That's part of our skin that we can see. And, uh, that sloughs off on a routine, routine basis that epidermis, all these layers are adhered to each other. So it's not like they're truly independent of each other. But basically, anytime you get into the, the dermis at all, you're going to get to a, uh, you're likely going to need suturing to repair it because the problem is, is you get gaping of the wound and gaping means that you just, your wound edges don't line up and they don't stay shut. Now, sometimes you can get a wound where it, it'll gape and then you can get the bleeding stopped and then it closes and it looks like it's not so bad. But then the problem is, is you, uh, you stress it or whatever, and it opens back up again. So like I said, basically if it's into the dermis, now you might say, well, I have no idea what that looks like, um, in real life. So I'm going to show some images. Is it okay if I show some, is anybody going to be too grossed out? I don't know. If, uh, hopefully it's not, not too bad. I can't see the chat at this point. So hopefully it's not too bad, but okay. So, um, Here's, here's an example of where, you know, you can see on, on this guy, uh, let me, let me back up a little bit too, is a couple different ways that you can, you know, create a wound that would require suturing is, you know, of course, a knife can do it, but you can also have an impact injury, right? Especially on the scalp and face, you have bone very, un, very close to the surface. And um, so this gentleman here, he was riding a bike and he did a header over and smashed his head on the concrete. So really, that's not a laceration with a knife, right? That's a, that's a basically almost an explosion of, of skin is what has occurred, right? So the skin has undergone stress between this concrete and um, his skull, and it broke open. So there's one type of wound. Um, let me show you. I'm gonna come, I'll come back to these in a second. Here's the one that's cut, uh, created more like with a, with a knife. And this was, this was sadly a, uh, an avocado, an avocado injury. So, uh, anyways, oh, okay. I see a comment, bring on the gross images. Okay. So I have, <laughs> I have another one here too. Let me see if I can, if I can share a different spot. I'm going to stop sharing for just a second. So I'm going to show you one second. So here's another type of a wound. 
this is a scalp wound. Again, I have a couple scalp wounds. I'll, I'll show you more about that. But you see how this, this edge is, uh, it doesn't look so bad, right? It looks like, oh, it's fairly well approximated. Approximated again, meaning like it's touching. You can see over here, like it's where it's a little bit more gaping and, and open. But the thing is with this particular wound right here, like if I were to tug and pull on it, it would open up right away uh, just because it is full thickness. So like, like I said, I think if we go back to, let me, let me show you this, the, go back to the finger really quick because we can look at the layers of the skin a little bit better here. Um, you can see how we're through the epidermis. There's no question about that. We're into through the dermis itself. And then you, you see how you can even see fat like kind of at the base of the wound. If At any point, if you see fat, that means you're through the, again, the epidermis and the dermis, and you're into the subcutaneous tissue. Some people call it the hypodermis, but anyway, uh, and you can see how it's gaping, right? So there's, uh, this wound was about two and a half centimeters. So it's a little bit over that two centimeter level. And the reality is, is it's just going to take a long time for that to heal if you don't do something about it. Uh, and, and of course you increase your chance of infection and those types of things. So I'm going to go back up here really quick and we're going to talk about the different types of suture repair. So on this gentleman, we'll, we'll go back to him just for a second because I used a combination of suture techniques and hopefully, hopefully you can see it adequately. Um, let's see, I've got another question here. I'll, I'll get to that question here in just a second, okay? That we're going to talk about different techniques really, just really quickly, but you can see, I don't know if you can see here, there's this, it's what's called a running suture where it's like one continuous type of suture. Then there's these individual ones. I'm going to show you a different picture here. We can see that a little bit better. So like these are these are what are called simple interrupted sutures where it's basically we take a section, we bring it together, we take another section, we bring it together. And then the uh, like another technique, the running technique is where we actually start it and then run along and it's one continuous. It's almost like sewing your pants or something of that nature. And then we end it. Now, the what are the advantages and disadvantages to these? is sometimes when you have a long wound, like on this gentleman's head here, let's see if I can get back to it. Uh, you know, I have, I have these sections that were a little bit kind of lengthy and uh, to do simple inerts up to suture just takes a little bit more time. It's not like one necessarily is better than the other or you're gonna have a better cosmetic outcome. You're, you're gonna be successful with either of these uh, techniques it's just really about whether or not it adequately approximates it. And like I said, when you have these really long sections, the running suture oftentimes is simply a little bit of a time saver uh, and when it's when it's indicated or, or able to do that. Now, having said that, so we're looking at this guy. I sewed his forehead and his head. He's he's bald, right? A lot of times if um, if they are if, if it's in the hair. So I'm going to go back to this other image here, the scalp wound. Um, if I go to here, so this gentleman, it's in his scalp line. The The scar is not going to matter quite as much. And it's also just in a place that's very amenable to placing staples. So you can see here that we have the staples in there. So what's another advantage of staples? Well, it's it's very quick. Um, you're, you might not believe this, but it um, actually, if I'm only putting like two or three staples in, it hurts less to get two or three staples than to actually get the, the thing numbed up. But what we can do on the on the scalp as we can uh, put some topical down like some let and then a lot of times pop those in so meaning it's a very it's time saving now you might say hey it's not about time saving it's about patient care and i'm like no and, and you're totally right the thing is the outcome is the same and so it's really just a matter of saying what's going to be best from all the different angles right the patient's going to have good wound outcome uh it's 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 efficient it's it works well it's tolerated well especially in the scalp, it, it works well. Now you can, you've probably seen, um, you've probably seen like, like uh, knee wounds or like uh, after total knees, sometimes they'll staple along the wound edge. So it can be done other places, but staples you don't typically do on a place that's going to bend significantly over a joint that is not going to be immobilized. So there's, yeah, I'm going to go, sorry, I keep on going back and forth between, uh, between screens, but uh Let's see here, go back to this one. Um, I'm gonna talk about adhesive right at the at the very end a little bit, but anyways, 
here's an example. So this gentleman, again, I want to just touch base on this because again, remember I said that this wound was caused by kind of an explosion, right? Meaning two hard surfaces uh, causing the skin to really tear. And you can see after we took the sutures out, there's still a wound um, or rather tissue that needs to heal because uh, there was crush injury in addition to the laceration itself. When we take this kind of a wound, this is like the sim simple interrupted approach that I was telling you about, where again, it's each one of these is its individual throw, its individual tie. And then this is what the wound looks like after, that was about after, I think almost a month. It takes about a year for a scar to mature all the way. So that's one thing that we tell people is like during that year, that period of time, you want to keep it protected from sunburn or from other, you know, exposures necessarily simply because that, that um, those tissues are remodeling. And if it were to get sunburn, especially on the face, then uh, that would hyper or that would accentuate the scar or the discoloration of the wound. Let me see what else here. We talk about like ad adhesive. Um, here's an image of that. The adhesive is great when you can use it, but like, for example, if I go back to this, this finger wound, I can't use it on that because there's too much tension, right? So it has to be some type of wound that is, that is basically without tension um, because it works well to keep things together, but it doesn't do well to, uh, to hold it together if it's under tension. So if you think back on that, that uh, scalp wound I was showing you that we put staples in, you, you could potentially, because those wound edges came together fairly well, you could potentially glue that. The only problem is when it's in the hair, it gets, it gets in the way of combs, you know what I mean? And so it, I, I have, I have put glue on people's scalps before and some, it works well, but the only problem is, like I said, is the patient has to deal with having glue stuck in their hair, you know? And so sometimes they don't like that. There's a good question right here. Any need for antibiotics when you have a clean slice from a knife? Thanks a lot for bringing that question up. Um, we don't routinely do antibiotics on wounds because um, it's only necessary when it's significantly contaminated and we can't get it clean or we can't be reassured that it's clean with irrigation alone. So the, the adage is uh, dilution is the solution to pollution. And more often than not, as long as we're able to get that wound clean, then it's the likelihood of it getting infected is extremely low. If we, if we think that we can't get it completely clean, um, then uh, sometimes we even will have them go to OR because that's how important it is to get something completely clean. Is it? So hopefully that makes sense right there. But like, for example, if you're in the kitchen cleaning things, even if you're cutting chicken or some of the raw meat, if you get that thing washed out, um, and when you get to us, we're going to wash it out again. And we do, sometimes we'll go through half a liter or sometimes even a liter of fluid just to ensure that that is as clean and as, as, uh, as we can before we, we go to close it. We don't do like irrigants with like, uh, like air, alcohol or peroxide or iodine because all those, those things do kill bacteria. They also kill good tissue and uh, your white cells, right? So you don't want to like, you're basically you're sterilizing the area but you're also killing the the things that need to help heal it and um, you're causing a little bit of an inflammatory reaction so if we were to say uh, yeah and tap water is is totally adequate for uh, irrigation it's really about volume if it's if it's potable water then it's usable to irrigate a wound so let's say for example you're at home you cut your finger or you cut something else if you can tolerate irrigating it under underwater then do it as fast as you can. You don't necessarily need to use soap, but you can use a very gentle soap, like either Dawn Blue soap or like Ivory soap. Those are really gentle, not a lot of stuff in them. Um, but a lot of people can't tolerate scrubbing their wound because they're freaking out. Uh, me included, by the way, it's not very fun to have to you know, scrub your own wound. But um, like I said, is, is tap water alone is, is typically adequate. If you're out, like let's say you're out hiking and you get a wound, uh, you can use your bottled water and and wash that out you want to do that as soon as you possibly can uh, and then get it covered as soon as you can uh, before you come into us now a lot of times what happens is is you cut yourself you wash it out really good you get it bandaged up and then by the time you come into the emergency department it's this little line and it looks approximated like 
you know, some of those wounds I showed you. Um, but the thing is, is that like, again, we know that it's probably, it's, it's approximated, but there's no strength to it. And so that's why we actually open it back up, irrigate it again, and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll suture it together to give it that tensile strength. Or sometimes, like I said, if it's in the right location, we can do, we can do derma bond just to keep it shut. You know what I mean? So let me think if there's something else I wanted to tell you about. Let's see how long can someone wait between. Okay. Great. Good question. Um, so 18 hours is about the maximum that you'd want to wait between a wound and having it re, uh, repaired. Now, if it's on the face, we'll go up to 24 hours. Um, if it's, I will tell you that if it's particularly contaminated, if it's a puncture wound from like a dog bite or some other type of animal bite, we typically will not repair those because again, the likelihood of that getting infected is increased. And another thing about those is we will oftentimes start people on prophylactic antibiotics for five days, typically with any type of a bite, whether it's a, a bite from a dog, or even sometimes if somebody punches somebody in the face and gets their, gets their knuckle on a, on a tooth, that's technically, it's not a, it's not a bite. It's a, like a reverse bite or a bite deconstructed, but anyway, it still is the same kind of thing where you, you, the bacteria from a mouth has gotten into the wound. We'll irrigate it a ton. Again, if there's a big flap or something that's going to be problematic, we'll sometimes loosely approximate it or get part of it put to, back together on the face. Most of the time we will repair it just because of the cosmetic outcome it is important to um, ensure that we have good approximation of that wound. Unfortunately, here's, here's another thing is that like, no matter what you do, no matter how it's repaired, um, a, a laceration or breaking the skin is going to scar. Now you can minimize the scar by appropriate wound repair and by appropriate management after the wound, which I'll tell you about in a second. But the expectation needs to be clear that when there's a break in the skin, there's going to be a scar of some kind. Now, how do you minimize that wound? Again, we wash it out really well, we repair it well. And then the individual needs to, if you keep it, uh, I don't know if the word is moist, but if you keep it covered, uh, technically the, or typically the outcomes are improved over an uncovered wound. Now that's usually, you keep it covered for maybe only three or four days is probably where you get the maximum outcome. But when I say covered, what I mean is a little bit of, you can use antibiotic ointment, but you can even use just plain Vaseline ointment, pet petroleum jelly and um, a Band-Aid uh, or keep it, like I said, keep it covered, keep it soft uh, for the first few days, especially uh, that will help the, the scar to be, it's kind of like, if you think about it, you're kind of like babying the scar, right? You're giving it a chance to have an optimal outcome. And then, like I said, after the sutures are out, which I'll tell you, we'll go through a list of kind of time periods for sutures. Um, but after the sutures are out, you actually want to keep doing that for a period of time just to ensure that that wound uh, can heal as, as optimally as possible. So in terms of time frame, on the face, we'll go as low as, depending on where it's at and how much um, tension there may be on it, it can be even as low as like three days having a suture in there. But usually we go about five days, sometimes ten, up to seven days if it's under an area that might have some, some tension on it. Um, on the hands, we usually do about five, or I'm sorry, about seven days. On extremities, we'll leave them in between seven and 10 days. Over joints though, anywhere there's any kind of a stress, then we will go longer than that. We'll go up to even 14 days. Uh, anyway, so that's kind of a, a general thing, a general kind of approach. Here's another question. What do you do for skin tears in the old adult where it might need stitches, but the skin may be too thin? Yeah, that's a great question because like with skin tears, the skin is too thin by definition, right? You just tore it. And so what we do with that is, again, what do we do first always? We always wash it out really well. As soon as we get as clean as we possibly can, we bring it back over, uh, kind of place it back where it is. Usually, if it's this true skin tear, there's not a lot of tension on it, you see, because it's not into the dermal layer. Remember that picture? Or it's still in the epidermis usually. Usually, we can get it laid out pretty well. And then we, you can either, uh, we can either use uh, tape or we can use derma bond, or sometimes there are some more advanced kind of wound uh, products out there, Epitel and Epiplex, and there's a bunch of different other brands and stuff like that. But it's it's a type of an almost like an adhesive that you can put on top of it that you just leave in place until it heals. 
So the intention again is that you um, you lay it out, you get it as clean as you possibly can, and you get it lined up as as well as you can. Again, it's the dermal layer when it's the epidermal layer rather than the dermal layer. The epidermal layer turns over fairly quickly, and so scarring is not as pronounced. And then also, like this might sound a little bit curt, but like on an older person, the scarring isn't quite as much of an issue as it is on a younger person. And um, so you're, but you really are trying to just do the best with what you can. Stereo strips, that's like, like I say, is like the, the tape or I, when I say tape, I'm sorry, I don't mean real actual tape. I mean like stereo strips. So, and do I ever use stereo strips very often? And the answer is no, I don't because I have other tools available to me. And usually if they're coming into me, the discussion is, is um, uh, can I just tape this? It's not usually that discussion. If I'm going to tape it, I'm probably going to put Derma Bond on it just because Derma Bond is, uh, well, I, I'm sorry, I'm using a trade name instead of just the, you know, t tissue adhesive, but I'm probably going to put tissue adhesive on there. Here's, here's the thing about tissue adhesive is, um, like I said, if it's, if it's in the right situation, works extremely well. Once you put that on there, the wound is done. Like you don't put ointment on there. You don't cover it. You don't do anything else. It just, it, it's done. In fact, if you put ointment on it, it actually breaks down the, the, uh, the, the adhesive qualities of the adhesive of the glue. And so it can actually weaken the repair. So, but the nice thing about that is you can wash your hands, you can shower, you can do whatever. It doesn't matter because it's, it's closed all the way. Typically we'll tell people, um, as long as sutures are in, we don't want that wound, um, submerged, but water can run over it, but we don't want it submerged like in a hot tub or bathtub or a sink or something of that nature. So. Any other questions or are we, we're probably about done with time, I imagine. So you have to take any other ones or did I answer them all to you? I think you got through all of them. I really appreciate you coming on. I put him on the spot and um, as proof, I didn't tell him what my role was when he was stitching up my son. Again, I was just so impressed at he was just talking and teaching me about what he was doing. So thank you so much for that. Thanks, um, and you never know who your patient might be. So you may, you could be recruited to get to do all kinds of fun things. That's true. And I will mention that you, you caught me by saying you stitched up my son's finger. I'm like, Oh, great. Oh no, here we go. <laughs> you know, that was the subject that line. <laughs> yeah. In the email. So I, like I said, though, I knew he would open it if I scared him a little bit, but yeah. We don't have any other questions. Um, and this will be available on YouTube on our Injury Prevention Learning Series channel. You can go and check out some of those other ones. Um, this is something that, well, I try not to cut stuff, but because I've got somebody in the house that will do it for me. Um, but, uh, oh, Dr. Baird, if you're still on, do you see that? Is there, is there an over-the-counter Dermabond? I've there is a there like a liquid band-aid that does exist and it is it's pretty much the same kind of stuff it's really just a matter of um and i've used actually i mean maybe i shouldn't say this but i've used just viscous uh super glue before and it doesn't work quite as well because but it is it is pretty much the same kind of stuff and i saw another thing about stereo strips like absolutely at home like stereo strips work great for anything like if you're comfortable with getting getting them on there um because again the idea what's the idea you have wound edges you want them to get together and you want them to stay together so if you can accomplish that then um that's the goal right yeah it looks like i don't know if uh yeah if you just look up like liquid band-aid um i think it's band-aid brand actually has um available so. but i will say if it, here's my just request I, if you don't feel like you can get it done well Please don't mess with it because now we have a wound with all this sticky stuff all over it. We got to debride it and it just gets like a mess. So maybe keep it to very simple things, you know what I mean? Because otherwise you're coming in and we're having to go through a whole, it's fine. We'll take care of it, whatever. But but it's uh, just only do it if you feel like, oh, yeah, I think this is going to be fine. How do you get liquid Band-Aid uh, off? Good question. I guess I guess I won't turn off my camera. Yet. Um, it what happens is again. Remember talking about the epithelial layer. Our epithelial layer turns over fairly rapidly. So within about ten to fourteen days, 
the skin that you initially adhered that to just has starts to fall off. And so it, it comes off uh, on its own. We typically tell people don't pick at it because again, you have a healing wound underneath it. So it's better to just let it flake off over time. It, it, it does. It can take two to three weeks sometimes for that to happen. So for some people, it's like as little as seven to 10 days. But again, so the answer is you don't take it off. You let it kind of just flake off over time. Ha having said that, if it's completely healed and you just wanted it to break down a little faster, you can put some petroleum jelly on it or just like Vaseline and it will, that'll help kind of break it down a little bit more, come off a little bit faster. Any other questions? We like awkward silence here. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, and we'll put together a little quick quiz for the CEUs and uh, get that out to everybody. Thanks for coming. Thank you for to Mike. He had to jump off. Um, uh, and to Dr. Baird for taking their time. Please, everybody be safe. We always tell each other when we leave the office, I do not want to review your chart. So have a very safe holiday. Keep the knives where they're supposed to be. And um, thank you for coming. Thanks, everybody. See you next time.